Good morning. You know what? I'm going to just take uh, Pastor Greg around wherever I speak and uh, make him do the introduction. Uh, how do you live up to that? Are you guys ready for some football? <laughs> You're like, hurry up, let's go. Uh, uh, well, you just wait just a few minutes, uh, whether you're rooting for the Broncos or the Patriots. Some of you don't care. So it's, uh, well, uh, just for a few minutes, I, I want to um, uh, share with you a little bit. Our, our family, we've been here since uh, July, and it's been a wonderful time just to sit and, and be with God's people and uh, not only learn more about Him, but figure out ways to integrate the principles that are being shared here um, into our lives. And and um, I, I thought it would be appropriate, given uh, what weekend this is, is that we start uh, talking a little bit about what it means to uh, have bold dreams. And the last couple of weeks, uh, Pastor uh, Gary, and, and he talked about and he set us up about potential signs of, of what's happening towards the end of history. And in the midst of that, he made this point that it's not just about selling everything and then just, you know, it world's going to end anyway, so let's just go ahead and get, uh, let's rack up our credit card bills. And, and he talked about really the wisdom of saying, look, it may or may not happen in the near future, but what's certain is that Jesus will one day return. And in light of that, we ought to live our lives in such a way, knowing that we really don't know when life is going to end, whether or not he comes back in the next uh, several years. So I want to talk to you about bold dreams, and I thought there was a man who's known for his dream speech. Do you know who I'm talking about? And I think most of you know is Dr. King. And I want you to listen and take it way back. And I was showing this video clip to my six-year-old daughter yesterday afternoon, and, and she was listening to his dream. And, and she, I guess, had learned a little bit at school about what it was like during that time. And, and she said, Daddy, did you know that people couldn't even share the same drinking fountain? And I asked her, do you think that was right? And she's like, no. And it, it, for her, she could not fathom a world in which people would do such things. Listen to the dream of an incredible man, an incredible uh, leader, uh, Dr. King. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh. Dreams can change the world, and I've had the great fortune of spending some time with people who are kind of part of his inner circle as well as their children, and, and, and the reality is he gave his life for a dream. And, you know, some of our dreams may be that grand. Others may impact directly just maybe our family or maybe our business, but the reality is dreams uh, take a lot of work to bring to life. Isn't it true that our world is filled with great ideas? Ideas, I often say, are, uh, you know, a dime a dozen. It's not really hard to get inspired. You can turn on the TV, you can watch the Winter Olympics, you can watch, you know, a movie, and we can walk away feeling really inspired about life. And maybe, you know, someone sparks an idea in you and you're excited to share with somebody else about this new idea that you have. And, but the reality is most ideas uh, never make it. Uh, did you know that over 90% of innovation projects within companies fail? And there are many, many reasons behind that failure, but most ideas don't see the light of day. Um, I love what Pastor Wayne uh, um, Cordero from New Hope in Hawaii, he often says is, if you want to find the greatest collection of human treasures on the planet, 
all you have to do is visit the local cemetery because in it are buried books that were never written, songs that were never sung or recorded, business plans that could have transformed communities, but people instead chose to take it to the grave. That's the world we live in. And the reality is, is that ideas have uh, several characteristics to it, and um, I have the fortune of working with ideas day in and day out. And here's some truths about ideas, and, and let me know if you agree. First of all, ideas can either help you or haunt you. And what I mean by that is, isn't it true that once you have an idea that's like a legitimate idea that may benefit the world or benefit your company or organization or benefit your family, is that if you act upon it, it will actually help you and become a better person. If you don't, it will haunt you for the rest of your life, right? Ever have a really good idea, you're like, this would be really good. You, you can't just shake ideas off. It's really difficult to do so. And the second thing is that ideas are impotent without action. It's, remember, one, you know, 1%, like Edison said, 1% what? Inspiration and 99% perspiration, right? Anybody can have an idea. Like, do you, like, have any friends where you meet with them, and every time you meet with them, they have an idea? And six months later, when you meet with them again, they still have the same idea? <laughs> right? A year later, they're like, man, I, I had this idea, and someone else took it. Right? Uh, they, they didn't take it. They just implemented it. <laughs> and, and, and the reality is, like, ideas are impotent without action. And here's the thing that I really want to bring home is we're going to see the story of a young man who had a dream, and that is ideas will be accounted for by God. And here's the little thing. So it's not just ideas. Like, whether it's an idea that comes from you that ultimately could glorify God, or whether it's an idea that God inspires in you so that he would be glorified in the long run, ideas will be accounted for by God. And this is a really important principle because if we are going to take account, be accountable for the ideas that we have, that means we are called to faithfully execute, not kill, implement the concepts, right? Uh, but here's what often happens, and I've been guilty of it as well, is that some of us have this tendency to just kind of take an idea when we first get it, and then we sprinkle a little Jesus over our ideas, <laughs> by saying, well, God gave me this idea. And you're not sure, but it sounds better when you say God gave me this idea, right? And so you sprinkle Jesus over the idea, and then when the idea doesn't come to life, then we sprinkle a little bit more Jesus on it and say, you know what? Uh, it wasn't God's timing. And it might be true. Maybe it wasn't God's timing. Other times, it's Jesus becomes an excuse for the lack of execution in our lives. And we could spiritualize it and say, well, I... I try, quote unquote. No, you just thought about it for a long time. Uh, but the reality is, is that Jesus is not just a stamp of approval on our idea. He actually wants to work with us in executing it. So for me, ideas about our, from at least the faith perspective, is about stewardship. Is that when God will entrust you, when, whenever he brings a concept or he allows a concept to kind of come to fruition, when he gives us something, he expects us to take care of it and steward it well. And I think a part of it is if God is the one, if you truly believe that God has given you some of these ideas, wouldn't it make sense that he would like to work with you to actually execute it? True? So I want to talk to you a little bit about ideas, about God-inspired dreams. And, uh, and, and kind of follow the story of this incredible 17-year-old we find in the Old Testament that had a dream. And I think through his life, as he becomes an adult, as he grows in his maturity, that we'll see by the end of his story how God gave him a dream, and it took, it's going to take over 13 years for it to actually come to life. But through it all, there are certain principles I think we can pick up. First of all is that God-inspired dreams are bold by nature. I mean, I love young people, and there's several here in this section. Um, not that you're not young, but you know what I'm saying. It, it is that they, they're bold. Like my son, um, um, my wife took him to see the doctor uh, last year, and, and the doctor said, your son will, my wife is pretty tall, and the doctor said, your son will probably be around 6'2", 6'3". I'm like, yes, he's Asian, and he's going to be 6'2", or 6'3". <laughs> so I, I was so excited, right? And I, I sat down with him, I said, are you excited? His name is Jonathan. He's 10 years old. And I said, are you excited, Jonathan? And he responds to me, yeah, I think I'm going to make it to the NBA and Major League Baseball. <laughs> huh. I'm like, that's awesome. 
And um, I said, well, you know, you're going to have to work really hard. He goes, no problem. And then, and then on top of that, he goes, well, I'm going to make it to Harvard, too, because Jeremy Lin, <laughs> right? So he has this bold dream, and I'm like, great, go for it. But you better go do your homework now, then, <laughs> you know? But it, it's, I love the youthfulness is that it doesn't matter what the dream is. They're like, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to travel to the moon and back somehow. Whether or not Virgin Galactic is ready or not, I'm, I'm going to go and go there and come back. And, and this 17-year-old in scripture named Joseph, he was the 11th out of 12 children. He was, you know, one of the youngest in this family. Has this dream. And I love the, you know, just really the real nature of the story. And I, I'm going to read this passage to you. It says in Genesis 37, it says, Now Israel, or Jacob, uh, his father, loved Joseph more than any other sons. So if you're in the youth group here, I just want you to know your, some of your parents love your sibling more. No, just kidding. No, that's, that's not true. Okay, we all love all of our kids equally. Uh, and it says, because here's why, in, in Joseph's case, because he had been born to him in his old age. Remember, he was child number 11 out of 12. This means at this time he was 17 years old. So probably some of his brothers were probably in their 30s, 40s, if not older. And it says here, and he made an ornate, a special robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And for me, growing up as an un only child, I never understood this until I had kids, right? I, for me, it's like mind-boggling. Why would you constantly argue with each other, right? And if you're an only child, you don't get this. I, I still don't get this. And I I'm not going to mention names, but there's this guy. His initials are Dan Cho, who led worship. Uh, when he was growing up, he, had, he has two brothers, older brother and younger brother. Dan took his younger brother and somehow convinced him to get inside of a pull-out sofa and he closed the sofa on his brother, and his parents were in the other room. His older brother was next to him. This was in the evening, and his brother got stuck, right? And of course, Dan, imagining Dan, he's always laughing at his brother, so he's laughing, and, and then they couldn't get him out. So he asked his uh, older brother, uh, his name is Sam, and says, hey, Sam, help me get him out, right? Because time was passing. His brother was saying, my arm's getting numb. And, and, and his older brother responds to him and says, you're an idiot. Just whatever. It doesn't even help him. So he left him there for like an hour. Watch out for Dan, right? And finally, because he was in so much pain, he went and got his parents and they got him out. Um, so siblings do that, right? And in this case, they hated him. They couldn't even speak one kind word to him. So this was the relationship. So here's what happens. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Here's why. He says, he said to them, listen, come here, guys. Come here. Come here. They all, I can imagine them all gathering around him, and he says, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. It, was, it kept going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> okay, just keep in mind, side note, he's 17 years old. This is what 17-year-old boys do. <laughs> okay, probably lax tact. It's not the great method. He didn't have coaching. He didn't have anything. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And can you imagine them rolling their eyes, and they're like, we're going to kill you soon. And, and this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to him. Now he's like bringing his parents into the picture, right? Mom, dad, and the, and the other stars. And it says, when he told his father as well as his brothers, because he lacks tact, his father rebuked him and said, what is the dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous. But interesting, his father kept the matter in mind. Here's the thing is that dreams that God inspires in you may sound ridiculous and incredibly bold. It may make you feel like you're arrogant for even sharing it. But if it's a God-inspired dreams, I want you to know God-inspired dreams are usually big bigger than what you ever hoped or, or dreamed about. 
But here's the thing, when God inspired dreams or any ideas that are starting to get to the execution phase is really that God inspired ideas are primed for resistance. That's the nature of ideas. Once you get going with a new idea, you're bound to face resistance. That's a guarantee, pretty much. This is what happens. So a little bit later in the story, um, um, Jacob sends Joseph to go check how his brothers are doing in the field. So as he's approaching them, this is what they say. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. So now he has a name. We're going to call you the dreamer. Come now, because we're a loving family. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Let's see if he can dream after he dies. Siblings are so loving, you know? And, and, and this passage in Genesis 37, 19 through 20, what comes out of it is, is Joseph meets incredible resistance at an extreme level where his brothers are like, you are going to bring shame to this family, so it's probably better to have you dead than to embarrass our name. There's some cultural dynamics that are happening here, not just straight hatred, but the fact that in that culture, when you live a particular life that brings shame to the rest of the family, it just hurts and kills the name of the family. And so as a result, they sell him to the Ishmaelites. They sell him, and because of that, he is orphaned at the age of 17. And I think sometimes when we read scripture, we just kind of pass by. But think about it. Some of you may have a 17-year-old. Can you imagine if they were today sold into modern-day slavery without you knowing through some fictitious story that somebody else makes up. And secondly, he is literally enslaved, and there he's sold to a, a family that buys him. It's pretty intense, right, when you put yourself in the, in the story. But here's the reality. When you, God inspires a dream, there's bound to be resistance. It may not be this extreme, but there's going to be lots of resistance. One of the reasons that sometimes innovation fails within companies is because the culture can't is not ready for it. I had the distinct privilege of meeting the head of innovation at GE with a couple other people, and we we're having dinner, and we were talking about some of the struggles like a large company like GE does. When they innovate, it takes a long time for innovation to be implemented, but he made a great point is that many companies, the reason that innovation fails, like a new project or a new business unit fails to launch properly, is because you know, often it takes three to four years to launch something. And sometimes after year two, the director of the project makes a lateral move to another department. And the new person coming in just doesn't, is not passionate about it like the former person was. And so there are certain cultural dynamics that can kill ideas and innovation. Other times it's just us. Did you know there's this part of your brain that um, is sometimes referred to as the lizard brain? It's this part of your brain that kicks in when you feel threatened. And you'll do everything in your power not to, you know, uh, get killed, if you will. Uh, for example, this part kicks in when you have an idea and you go to a supervisor and you, you want to tell them, hey, I have this new way of doing something. And yet some part of your brain and your mind, some ideas come out that are totally irrational. Things like your idea is not good enough. You'll get fired if you share that idea. <laughs> It's not going to turn out right. People are going to laugh at you because uh, they think it's really not great innovation anyway. And chances are is probably over 95% of those uh, reasons that you come up with are irrational. Isn't it true that when we like, try to encourage somebody else with their idea, we're like, incredibly optimistic, right? Oh, you can do it. That'd be a great idea. You should go for it. But what happens when you turn the table and talk about your own ideas? We're like, no, we haven't done enough research. In, in other words, we got to take our own advice because when we hear someone else's ideas, it's possible that we get to see it from a clear per picture and say, yeah, that actually makes sense. And, and so the reality is resistance is going to be a part of it is whether or not in those moments you can faithfully continue to live out whatever God has given to you. Here's, here's the reason why. is because God-inspired dreams are shaped by pressure and the choices we make. So God-inspired dreams are shaped by pressure and the choices we make. So Joseph finds himself sold into slavery. He did not choose that. But even when he gets to Egypt, 
to a place where he ends up in, a, in the house of Potiphar, God is still with him. Listen to what happens and the pressures that he receives soon as he starts to get a little bit successful. And I think this is really important to kind of note. The Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So because of his faithfulness, even though he was in a horrific situation of being a slave and sold, I mean, think about the emotional trauma of being really disconnected with the rest of his family from the father that deeply loved him. I'm not sure if he was sad because he was away from his brothers, but you know, right? And he ends up in this place where he faithfully works. It says, from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And the field represents you know, uh, in an agrarian culture, the more successful your field was, that means that's really your economic viability to survive. It says, so if Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care, with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph, listen to this, was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of him and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go with her or even be with her. And as the story goes, she um, a few days later, she finds him alone and, and basically invites him back once again to go to bed with her. And he refuses, runs out, and then she accuses him of raping her. And he ends up in prison as a result. But here's what I love about Joseph is he could have, because he was tasting a little bit of success and his dream was becoming a little bit more reality, where there, there are these moments when your new business or your new organization or, or maybe a new position starts to take off, there's going to be pressure for you to compromise not only your morality, but the shortcut to success, the road to success. And I think it's really important in those moments not to lose sight of the fact that just because you think you're all that now, right, is that there's more. Don't compromise the more for the moment. I love Joseph's ability to not get lost in the moment. And that's pretty impressive because he's still relatively young. That in that moment, he chooses to live by what he deemed to be right. Now, was he tactful in telling his brothers and his families? Abs probably not, no. But in the midst of that, God did something you can tell in the life of Joseph. He was a remarkable young man to be able to stay focused in the heat of the moment. And even as he remained faithful, what was the next one? It doesn't just resolve itself. Potiphar doesn't just suddenly say to his wife, you know what, I believe Joseph, not you. He ends up in prison. And the story continues. And while in prison, um, he hears a, really, you know, the dreams of the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was asking the you know, uh, kind of his magicians and others to figure out what his dreams meant, and Joseph begins to interpret his dream. But here's the thing. In Genesis 41, 42, and we won't have time to read those passages, but what you'll see during that time is Joseph develops. And one principle to draw from 41 and 42 of Genesis is that God-inspired dreams often take time to develop and execute. Just because it's been two months in trying to execute your God-given dream, my, my encouragement to you is don't give up. In fact, in Genesis 41 42, ultimately Joseph becomes pretty much the right hand guy of the Pharaoh, and he oversees the land. Well, by this point, he is 30 years old. So God gave him a dream 13 years prior, 
And for 13 years, through ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, he finds himself finally in a place of great authority. In fact, he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream, but his friend forgot to give him credit. And so over and over, you can imagine the emotional ups and downs. Oh, it's getting better. God's with me. Oh, shoot, I'm down in the pits again. And over and over, that was kind of his life over 13 years. He's still really young. At 30 years of age, he comes to this place of leadership. Here's what I really learned and appreciate about Joseph the dreamer, is that God-inspired dreams come to life when we focus on faithfulness and God's will. When it's all said and done, one thing's for sure is that I think we, we have plenty of reasons to stay humble. You may be really well known in one vertical or one profession or maybe one organization. And my wife keeps me humble this way. He's, she says this, just remember that out of the 7 billion people in the world, 6.9999 have no idea who you are and don't even care. <laughs> and the reality is, you know, we're all human beings at the end of the day, right? And what I love about Joseph's story is in the midst of it, he's not buying his own hype. And it's kind of interesting because it's going to come full circle. He remains faithful. God honors him. He's in this place of leadership. And now what happens is there's this huge famine in the land. And his brothers outside of Egypt come to Egypt because Egypt had stored grain and had stored resources because of Joseph's advice. And his brothers end up in front of him, but they have no idea who this person is. I mean, think, do you ever like watch movies and, and the bad guys eventually find themselves in a position where they're going to get justice, right? And this is, remember, his sibling, right? And so his brothers find themselves in Joseph's court. And Joseph places an object in their back because he tells them, go back to your father and tell him X, Y, and Z. And, and when they go and they come back, they find this thing in their bag, this item, and, and Joseph, basically the guards and everybody, accuse them of stealing from the royal court, right? So Joseph's setting them up for something. And in the midst of that, the brothers end up back in his presence, and we're going to read a passage in Genesis 45 where Joseph reveals himself, okay? So this is, like, pretty intense. And, and Joseph, it says here, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, because it was getting to him. He, he, he wanted to let his brothers know who he was, and he says, have everyone leave my presence, so, so there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brother. So it was just him and his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and the Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. And here's why. Because they were terrified at his presence. Wouldn't you be? Right? You try to kill him, you sold him into slavery, and somehow you stand in the presence of the, someone who could actually control the fate of your own life. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Can you imagine what his brothers were thinking? It's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'll stay back over here. Uh, why don't you go, Reuben? Uh, why don't you, and telling his brothers, go. And, he, and, and, and they were probably terrified. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. It's not getting any better right now, right? You're just kind of put yourself in their shoes. You're like, oh, shoot, he remembers. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Remember, he's only about 30 years old. Incredible wisdom. He's experienced a whole lifetime of pain and struggle. And he has an opportunity to get back at the ones who caused the pain. In fact, in Jewish oral and written tradition, they refer to this passage as the prime example of what it means to have brotherly love. That they would refer to this particular moment in Jewish history to say that's how siblings ought to, once again, dwell in unity. And it says there, so then, it is not you who sent me here, but God. Remember, it's about focusing on faithfulness and whose will? God's will. 
He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Don't you want to just take a step back from the story and, and just go, wow. Isn't it amazing that this young man, that these are the words that came out of his mouth? If it were me, I would have toyed around with his brother, my brothers a little bit longer. <laughs> and what I love is that he focused on faithfulness and God's will throughout the whole thing. And that's what I really respect about Joseph. Here's the thing about chasing your dreams or, you know, really getting to a place where you execute whatever you believe God has given you, or whether it's something that you came up with and yet God is with you in it through execution. And, and, and that is when we focus on faithfulness, I'm a firm believer that we can't fail. The results of your pursuit may be different from what you had intended it to be, but if you are faithful to God through the process of pursuing your dreams, you will never fail in the eyes of God. And the reality is that the idea you start with is rarely the idea you end up with anyway. <laughs> what you end up with will be far greater than even the bold ideas you thought you had when we remain faithful to God in, in the midst of that. And here's what I want to end, end this message with, and it's just a couple of truths about life. First truth in Scripture that we know in books like James is that life is short. It's kind of like, you know, living here in the South Bay when you wake up, uh, there's that morning dew, right? The morning fog, the morning mist. Uh, it goes away pretty quickly. And life is kind of like that. It's really short. And um, for some of you, I know I'm still really young. For others, I'm very old. My, my daughter asked me yesterday, so dad, does old start when you're over 40? <laughs> I'm like, no. It <laughs> starts when you're born because you're six years old. Uh, <laughs> ah, no, uh, then I realized, man, I'm picking on a six-year-old, so I backed off. <laughs> okay? But life is short. You just don't know. It's not about how old you are. The fact is we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, um, my parents uh, divorced when I was early, and uh, they both for, uh, got remarried, and and I had a stepbrother, and he was older than me at the time, and, and uh, he was only 38 years old, and he had a little bit of struggles with a heart condition, and, and one morning, he just didn't wake up, and that's how he passed away, at a real young age of 38. And what I, what kinda, what I realized in that moment was that you just don't know. The reality is, like, if you, like, woke up this morning, just remember that God didn't have to wake you up. That life is short and it's really in his hands, not ours. And the second thing is that we're not home yet. Hebrews is pretty clear. We're just kind of passing through earth. Ultimately, our rest is in, 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 in eternity with, with God. And although that eternity starts now, it's true. It says in John about we are simultaneously living in this world and the world above. That's totally, totally the case. But know that our physical lives here on earth, this is not the end of the story. And if you really believe that life is short and that this ain't home, we have to kind of put things in perspective where we're not solely building our kingdom here on earth. Is that one day this too will end, whether we pass away into, into eternity or into, into life with God, or he comes back. But regardless, the reality is, is I'm not saying don't set up a great future for your kids or your loved ones or your friends, but know that we're not home yet. Don't get too comfortable. At best, this is, this is like staying at like a motel, right? Home is waiting. It, it'd be silly if you walked around and said, man, isn't this a great motel? They have free continental breakfast, and they have a waffle maker. <laughs> and we're like, check out my waffle maker. My waffle maker is better than your waffle maker. And it would be silly to say that that's what you really pride yourself about. And some of the things we pursue are solely for the purpose of building stuff here. And fine, you can build stuff here, but know that this ain't it. This is not really the end of the story. It's actually the beginning of a great story. And thirdly is this, if you're still alive, 
God is not done with you. Um, I was in Chicago this, this week, and, and I was sitting down with a friend, and he, he is you know, becoming a phenomenal voice, and he's doing some amazing things. And, and you know um, he's doing uh, well because he's been a friend for a long time, and I've walked with him for years. And he just he turns around and says, guess what? I get to sit on a panel with Richard Branson in Switzerland and later this month. I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know who Richard Branson is, he created the Virgin brand. And we're just kind of talking, but he, uh, for the last couple of years, have, has gone through hell. Uh, in his marriage, in a lot of areas of his life, he went through an incredible dark period. And what he, what he did was he turned to me in, and, and uh, he was kind of describing this journey, and, and we have kind of walked, and we've remained friends throughout the whole process. And, and he said, you know, he looked to me with literally like he started with tears in his eyes. He says, you know, Charles, I want you to know that darkness almost got me. Darkness almost got me. And he's like, for whatever reason, it didn't fully get me. My life is still screwed up. There are many things that are going phenomenally well. Other parts are completely broken. It isn't a happy ending, and darkness almost got me. But in the midst of that, I still see light. And I, I wanted to encourage him and say, look, and regardless of where he is, friends are friends. So we, we learn how to kind of live life together. But I was once again encouraging him to say, look, if you're still breathing, there's still something you're meant to do. And no one else may know, but there's still something you're meant to do. You know, a couple of months ago, um, um, actually about 10 years ago, my mother called me from, she, was, she had been in the restaurant industry for a long time, so if you eat Korean buffet, you should thank my family because they, they create a, a lot of what you experience. So um, <laughs> she was doing, she changed fields and she was doing business in China. And, and she, she called me one day and said, hey, um, I think I want to start an orphanage. And I said, what? What are you, what are you talking about? And, and that was during the time when um, I, there was a season where I was working uh, in the church and, and uh, teaching at a college. And, and uh, she was the one who said, are you sure you want to serve at a church? Because, you know, my parents are business people. I'm the only child. They wanted to entrust everything to me. And, and I said, I'm going to study philosophy, teach philosophy at a college and work at a church. And, <laughs> and they laughed, too. Um, so... <laughs> So, she, you know, she, uh, she said, I want to take care of these kids. Many of them are physically or mentally challenged. And, and out of the blue, she just started an orphanage, and it's 10 years later now. And, and she has about 40 kids that treat her like Mother Teresa. Most of these kids don't have legal status. Uh, she's like the first U.S. citizen in that area to have permission by the government to run this. And, and a couple of months ago, she was visiting. She goes back and forth. And, and she had a severe stroke on the left side of her brain. And as a result, she's lost her ability to move her right side. Um, it wasn't until this past week where she began to actually be able to swallow water. She still can't speak. So she's been in the hospital for the last couple of months. And it's been an intense season for us. And, and you know, many people call uh, people like myself and our family in kind of the sandwich generation, right? You take care of your parents as well as your kids. And um, I knew this day maybe would come, but I didn't, no one plans for it, right? <laughs> you can't put it on your iCal. And, and she's been in this place, and uh, it's been really difficult because she's always been a strong woman. She's the business person. She gets stuff done. She's never asking for favors. She's giving away tons of money. And, and you know, I remember her, like, giving away a car to one of her employees because they needed a vehicle. I mean, she's always been generous. And to find her in a place where she's immobile, not always coherent, coming in and out of consciousness. And, and to be in that moment, I, I remember sitting down with my wife uh, recently and saying, I have no idea why God would allow this for her specifically. I mean, not that I would wish it upon anybody else, but why pick someone who literally lives a life, you know, if you've ever read like old like orphan stories of like George Mueller and and these miraculous findings, like she prays for stuff in the morning and she gets it in the afternoon. And, and she lives out the book of Acts. I'm like, God, I mean, if there's anybody on the planet you might want to keep healthy, 
It's probably her. And I remember sitting there, even yesterday I was visiting her, and, and um, she just lying there, and I kept thinking, like, while well, thinking about the points of the message, I'm like, okay, she's still breathing, so God must not be done. I mean, minimally, it's been good for my soul because I feel like I've spent more time with God in the last two months than a long time. But that's a selfish reason. But whatever the case may be, God was not done. Here's the thing about bold dreams is, is this. If you are still breathing, tr- f- ca- you know, fulfilling whatever dreams that God has given you, age does not matter. Your socioeconomic status does not matter. Ultimately, it's something that God provides. Here's the thing about bold dreams is bold dreams matter too, and you could fill in the blank there. I have a feeling for all of us here, bold dreams matter to us in our own development. I think it matters to our family. You know, um, if you are a uh, parent of children, your bold dreams for your family matter to your kids. I remember sitting with a brilliant young man, um, and he does a phenomenal thing in Atlanta, and sitting with him, and he says, he challenged me with a question, it was a really legitimate question, and he says, Charles, what are you passionate about? I said, I love my family. And he said, are you as creative with your family as you are your clients? I was like, stop talking. (laughs) But the thing is, our bold dreams for our family should matter. Maybe for your company or organization. Does it matter? Yes. Because some of you are doing work that literally impacts millions of people. Your company impacts those millions of people. And the ability for you to do better is not just to advance your career. It's to make a better company that could better help the world. Because I think good businesses actually help our world. Bold dreams matter. So whatever that dream is, the fact is we have to take steps and that's why I talk with uh, Pastor Gary, and he's very gracious. And, and he said, why don't you do an event to help people start off the year of taking a concept and executing it well? And that's what the one day is about. Um, and like, like they mentioned, none of that comes to me. It's just really I want to figure out ways to help support my mother's orphanage. And then more importantly, in many ways, is that my life mission is to reduce the percentage of people who take their ideas to the grave. Our world needs your ideas executed well so whatever it is do little things like write stuff down and you'll learn principles on how to move thoughts forward did you know interesting side fact and i'll close with this is that uh, if you're somebody who has a dream or an idea and is quick to share it without processing it or writing it down did you know you're less likely to actually do anything with it studies have shown Because talking about your idea tricks your brain into thinking you're actually doing something about it, right? That if you talk about it long enough, it kind of feels like you're doing something and actually you're hurting yourself. So we'll talk about all of these different types of principles of actually getting your concept to market if that's your idea or helping your department and so forth. And I encourage you, this is a great church. Let's invite some of our coworkers to it. And um, it's, there's nothing specifically in there that has a faith component to it, the seminar, it's, it's worked across, whether you're a multi-billion dollar industry or a nonprofit just starting up. And that's kind of like the heart. And so here's the thing, I would love for you to not take your dreams to the grave. Can I pray for you? If you would just for a moment as we close, is that just take a moment, think about, maybe it's an idea that you had when you were a teenager, just like Joseph. Maybe it's an idea you came up with last week. One, ask yourself, does this support what God's doing in this world? And if the answer is yes, let's start working on it. And some of you are in places where you're a little bit discouraged because you've been at it for a little while. It took Joseph over 13 years. If it's a legitimate idea that honors God, maybe there are other ways. Maybe you need some more voices that kind of speak in to how to take it to execution. But in any case, let's steward the ideas and the dreams that God has given us. Father, I am deeply humbled to know that in this room are dreams and ideas that could literally change the trajectory of human history. And not all of us will be at a place like Dr. King, but this weekend, may this holiday remind us every year 
to live boldly and to pursue our dreams in a way that ultimately honors you. Father, talk is cheap, and we know that through Scripture, that we will not only be hearers of the word, but doers. So, Father, we commit our dreams and our ideas to you, dreams for our, ourselves, our families, our friends, our coworkers, the things that we're a part of. And ultimately, may you be the one that's spotlighted and honored through our lives. Life is short, and we're just passing through, Lord. So until we see you again at home, let us do our best to live out our ideas. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.